Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Tuesday takedown. A number of people just have bad ideas, bad arguments, and bad apologetics. And today we have all three of those coming from a video from Sean McDowell on the influence of the Bible. I'm going to play this one minute short from his channel, and then we are going to dive right in. Did the Bible just come about because like a group of random dudes decide to like just write like a book? Instead of giving an answer, I'd say, well, that's interesting. What makes you think that the Bible came about by a bunch of random dudes. Why do you think it's the most influential book? Government, music, art, history, literature, architecture. Why do you think that book has shaped more lives and history than anything? And there's really no answer to that. Questions are almost always better than answers. You don't have to prove the Bible wasn't written by a bunch of random dudes. Nobody believes that. Anybody who knows history and art and literature has at least have to recognize that the Bible's brilliant and influential and the greatest book that's ever been written. Okay, so we have a lot to discuss here. He hit on a lot of different things and it's a pretty weird answer to this question when you really sit back and think about what the original question was. And we're going to go through each part of this answer. And one of the things that stands out to me before we even start breaking the video down is that he seems to pride himself on not having to give an answer. Even though he provides a lot of answers that have almost nothing to do with the question, he thinks it's better just to ask questions back. A lot of these questions are pretty heavy handed though. They're assuming a whole lot. Some of them don't even have to do with the original question and all to what purpose? I mean, this question is a good question. First of all, a lot of people don't understand how did we get our Bible? How did these books get collected? What was the canonization process like? Do we know for certain who wrote it? How many different authors was it? Why did they write this? Why did anyone feel the need to write these things down in the first place? And depending on where you come from in Christianity, there's a lot of different Christian answers to that. There's some different scholarly answers to that as well. Why not have an open and multifaceted and nuanced conversation about what we can know, what we don't know, what that means, and why this book to some people is still important? No, the apologist has to say, you know what? I'm not going to answer that. Instead, I'm going to ask you some questions. Like what? Why? And so his answer back to him is, I'll ask you the same question. Why do you think it was put together by a bunch of random dudes? And instead of waiting for a response or trying to make a point off of that, he goes into the diatribe about why do you think it's the most influential book in this, 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 and this. And we're going to get into all of those. But I want to start with the initial question. Why would someone think the book was put together by a bunch of random dudes? Well, we all know the stats, and this is something Christians brag about. Look at this. We have a book or a collection of books that was written over the span of 1,500 years. It's not a perfect number, but many people will say written by over 40 different authors in three different languages. And yet look at how consistent it is. Look at how it works together so well, right? That's sometimes a selling point for some Christians. Now, if you've been watching my channel at all, you know that I think and can prove this Bible does not work well together. And there are so many inconsistencies and contradictions simply because it was written over 1500 years by over 40 different authors within three different languages. Yeah, that's going to lead to problems, but that's a conversation for another time. Something that I think would serve anyone that is truly asking this question would be to look into the scholarly approach on how we understand what we understand about the Bible, not just about the Bible, but about any historical documents. That's all the Bible is. It's a collection of historical documents that were written at different times for different purposes in different genres and styles. Some were written to record history. Some were narrative, some were metaphorical, some were poetical, some were apocalyptic, some were prophecy. We have many things that were going on here and they were done for different reasons. You might look at books like Ezekiel and Job and see the budding beginnings of certain kinds of philosophies, dealing with theodicy or nihilism, etc., showing a group of people that were wrestling with the issues they had with their God. Other books are for the law. They were literally put together and amalgamated and collected from oral tradition to give a certain people group an idea identity and a moral course to follow. Some were written as propaganda, some were written as warnings. It's an amazing thing to look into and learn. So I'll wrap up this first part by saying, yeah, it's probably unfair to a degree to say it's a bunch of random dudes that just wanted to write stuff down and put it all together. There wasn't this forethought of we're making a Bible, not till the canonization processes. And I understand if he's on stage answering a Q&A, he's not going to get into all of this, but could you not reference some of these things? Different people believe different things, and here's how we can know some things, some things we take on faith, even if you're speaking from a Christian perspective. Perspective. It's just insane to say the best way I can answer this is to not answer it, to put it back on you, and then to assume a whole bunch of other things in a question that I'm going to put back to you that makes it sound like I've won my case for why the Bible is true and why this God is correct. Like, what? Where are we 
going with this. It's so frustrating that there's such little care for precision or honesty when dealing with what is supposed to be the epitome of truth. But let's get into those claims that he makes. I'm going to play it again just so you can hear it. Why do you think it's the most influential book, government, music, art, history, literature, architecture? Okay, so we're going to go through these things individually. But first, I just want to say how small one's worldview has to be to make these kinds of generalizations. The Bible has been important and it has been impactful. It has carried a weight of influence. I don't know anyone who denies that, even from the atheist side. But the most influential in these specific five categories worldwide? No way. Nope. Sorry, it's just simply not true. At certain times within history, within certain countries or cultures, yes. Again, can we get some precision of language? Let's talk about this first one, government. Has the Bible influenced legal systems and governance structures? Sure, sometimes for some people, yes. Many people would be thinking of America. In fact, I just watched an incredible conversation on the flight back this week between Alex O'Connor and Michael Knowles on this particular question. They both have a really great grasp of the history of the beginning of this nation. And it was fascinating as I'm just, I love the history of America. I think when you get older, you start to get more interested in this. For a long time, I was only concerned with ancient history and mythologies and things like this. But it is fascinating to look at the founding fathers and what they believed. There's enough information even there where we would look at something that seems to be so commonly accepted that America was founded as a Christian nation and it's not that cut and dry. Again, I'll link it down below. It's a really interesting conversation. But that's just the government of one country for the last couple hundred years. How has the Bible been influential more than any other book in history for government? It simply has not. What a small view. There have indeed been some laws and policies that were made that came straight from the Judeo-Christian value set or what is written in the Bible. There's also plenty that were left out. There's also plenty that were amended. There were also plenty that were added. So yeah, like again, let's be careful with what we're actually trying to assert here. But in no way is, again, if we're talking just about America here, a copy and paste of Mosaic law or even Judeo-Christian values. And how about all the other ancient legal codes that existed before the writing of the Bible. In fact, we know the Bible took something straight from the Code of Amurabi, which is from ancient Mesopotamia that predates the Bible. Should we back the train up and say, you know what, without the Code of Hammurabi, which inspired certain parts of the moral code of the Hebrews, we wouldn't have our Judeo-Christian values that translated into the American political system. Like, that would be ridiculous. So why back it up to a certain point and then stop and not consider to always look at all of the influences? We also have a lot of influences from ancient Greco-Roman culture that had nothing to do with the Bible. And none of this even says anything about all of the other countries or all of the secular governance that does go on. We have plenty of modern countries with constitutional democracies that operate completely outside of the scope of anything biblical. And in many times to quite the contrary, countries that prioritize the principles of equality and justice and human rights. The Bible has some of that, but only for some people and only sometimes we've had to expand past the morality of the Bible to get the moral systems that most of us in most countries today enjoy. Let's move on to the next one. After government, it was art. And yes, the Bible undoubtedly inspired countless works of amazing art. Some of the art that I love the most in the world that comes from the Renaissance era is absolutely biblically inspired. I mean, the Bible is 800,000 words that covers a plethora of the human experience. But what about Islamic art? Calligraphy, geometric patterns, lots of architectural design, draws plenty of inspiration inspiration from Islamic theology. Does that make it matter? That's the other thing. Like, why does this matter? Does it make it more true if it's more influential? Talking about appeal to majority or authority. What about Asian arts? What about the Chinese or the Indian or the Japanese arts? I can't make out much biblical inspiration in them. What about contemporary art movements? Abstract expressionism or surrealism or conceptual art that tries to prioritize the human emotion or experience not relating back to something biblical and oftentimes counter biblical. It's just such a denial of the whole world around us and all the different times that, that art has existed. It's really just sad. But to the Christian sitting in the audience who's like, yeah, that's right. The Bible is amazing. We've just shut down so much critical thinking. We've 
continue to narrow the human experience to me now, what I know, my culture, my history, and we lose an opportunity for perspective and for truth. Oh, actually, you know what? We skipped music. This is just like one of the weirdest parts of the claim. Has the Bible inspired music? Yes. Look at gospel. Look at hymns. Look at even Gregorian chants. Many oratorio or opera is based off a biblical aspect. But my gosh, are we just going to completely ignore Hindu music or Islamic music? What about tradition African music or Chinese music? What about Aboriginal music or Native American music? What about all the secular classical music? And yes, some of the classical music gets associated back to being inspired by God, but not all of it. No way. And again, all of the other parts of the world and cultures that have no concept of the Bible whatsoever, and yet we're able to produce music most of which predates the Bible. Going back to history, though, I don't have too much to say here because I don't know if he's just trying to make the broad claim that it's the most influential book in history or it's the most influential book in history about history, which wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. Let's do some math here really quick. Let's say we have a pre-biblical era, a biblical era, and a post-biblical era. How many people existed for the 200,000 years that humans were on the scene before the Bible came along? There's some estimates out there. I have no idea how accurate they are. I know they come with degrees of error, but it's something around like 90 billion people. Then you have the 1500 years, that biblical era, where the Bible is being created and is becoming on the scene in one fashion or another, whether it's still just in the oral traditions, or there's some manuscripts floating around, or people are starting to copy it, the New Testament's being written, whatever you want to say. How much of the world didn't have a chance whatsoever to even have access to that Bible? And then the construction of the Bible is finished, the canonization process is on, so the post-biblical history of the world. And yet we know for a fact there are still areas today where it would be very rare for someone to have ever even heard of the good news, the gospel, or the Bible itself. So saying that it is the most anything in history is fundamentally false false, but saying that it is the most influential part of history in general is crazy. Again, let's just list off every culture that has nothing to do with it and yet still had their own history, their own narratives, their own stories, their own myths, their own dealings with philosophy and culture and religion. It's just amazing to me that anyone can make this kind of a claim with a straight face. The other two are literature and architecture, and I fear that we're going to start repeating ourselves, so I'll try to cover new angles with this. But has the Bible been extremely influential in literature? Yes. Western literature, I mean, right there, we're already kind of divided dividing it in half and like really recent Western literature. You know what came before the Bible that we would consider to be influential in Western literature? Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. And I think there is a great case to be made that it is as influential, if not more. And as someone who has read a lot, I have read plenty of modern and even classical literature that doesn't draw on the Bible whatsoever. Much does though in the Western canon, and that's kind of cool. There was a book that was influential enough for a period of time that many who came after it used it to build off of. Great. Again, no truth value inserted into that whatsoever. Just like however influential we could agree that the Odyssey is doesn't mean that the events described in the Odyssey actually happened. All of this is nonsense to argue in the first place because it doesn't equal truth. But let's get to this last one, architecture, because I think that was a really interesting claim when I first heard about it and I had to think about it. And I was like, okay, definitely in the construction of churches or cathedrals, which are amazing. If you haven't read Pillars of the Earth, which is a fictional account of many people's lives who are touched during the process, the generational process of building a cathedral, it can give you a little bit of an idea into what this would have been like at that time. Yeah, and that's fascinating. And it definitely, you could say, was influenced from biblical efforts. You could also say it's kind of counter-biblical because other than the temple building, which is where God was supposed to reside, you could see it as antithetical to many biblical claims, especially New Testament claims about what the church should look like. That's the other thing. Acting like any of this is consistent like we have this consistent influencer message from the Bible or from Christianity that people are then taking and then building off of, like, no. And then I thought, yeah, okay, biblical inscriptions or even stained glass. Like we have a lot of elements of architecture that you could say are kind of unique to the religious side of architecture, but it's the most influential in history for architecture. I'm sorry, what part does the Bible play in modernism or postmodernism when it comes to architecture? When we prioritize innovation or functionality or social relevance into 
or architecture, where is the Bible fitting in there? What about all the architectural masterpieces out there that are completely non-biblical? All the other non-religious buildings, this could be like museums or courthouses, libraries and civic buildings. These serve secular functions. And many, by the way, who haven't innovated have still kind of been basing things off of the Greco-Roman world, at least if we're still talking about the modern West. But what about all the other religious architecture? Go look at a temple in China and tell me where the Bible fits in. Go look at the Great Mosque in Saudi Arabia and tell me where the Bible gave blueprints for. Which wing of the Taj Mahal did they reference the New Testament for? Like, it's so silly to make these claims. And to put a final pin in this particular point of the video, he says just a quick sentence I want to focus on. Why do you think that book has shaped more lives and history than anything? And there's really no answer to that. There is an answer to that. We understand how religions evolve. We understand how they change. We understand that Christianity started within Judaism. We understand and are understanding more every day, even if there's not quite a consensus yet on the origins of the Yahweh God, the God of the Jews, coming from a Canaanite pantheon, for example, as we've been talking about in Dissecting the Divine, that coming from older Ugaritic myths. So we can trace some of this back and then understand, okay, what well, they were expecting a Messiah. So you had many Jewish cults that were looking at the Jewish scriptures to try to identify a Messiah in a time and place. And Jesus was not the first nor the last, by the way, but there was a collection of people that believed, and sure, they really believed. Great. Some of them even died for their belief. Great. Doesn't make it true. And early Christianity starts as a Jewish subcult, essentially. And then, like it or not, it was due to some very heavy influence from Roman politicians choosing to utilize Christianity for control. And then the popularity of Rome and its influence in the West that has led in a really overgeneralized statement to how Christianity's influence did spread to the point that it did. And we have 2.3 billion Christians on the earth today. Not that they all believe the same thing by any means. We also have 1.9 billion Muslims. So again, if we're just talking about numbers and influence, does it matter? There will be a day in the near future if trends continue in the same direction where there's more Muslims than Christians. Does that make Allah immediately true all of a sudden? When that date comes and one more person deconverts from Christianity and one more person converts to Islam, all of a sudden, does that religion become true? Should we all swap out our Bibles for Qurans? If not, then what is your point? So again, getting back to his question of why do you think that book has shaped more lives in history than anything? First of all, I don't agree that it has. But to the degree that it has shaped lives and history, we can track why. We understand the need for religion. We understand that most countries and cultures and people groups throughout most time have invented some kind of religion. You can maybe point to this if you want to really stretch even this fact to say that well, that points to deism at least being more true than atheism. That still would be incorrect logic, but it would make a lot more sense than the specific God of Christianity, right? If you're not addressing the world phenomenon of spirituality, you're just addressing the influential parts of Christianity. You're trying to have your cake and eat it too, and it simply will not work. And most people who are critically thinking should be able to see past this. But many people do not want to think critically. Many people want to be affirmed of what they already believe. And so a smart sound Sean McDowell can come on and say some things and make these overgeneralized statements and people feel reassured. And this seems to me to be the main goal of the apologist. Calm the doubts. It's wordplay. It's allowing the doubters to feed off your confidence to believe the thing they already wanted to believe in the first place. Why this God of perfect truth would require this little song and dance at all is truly beyond me. Anyways, the thing he says next is hilarious to me in talking about this kind of apologetics. Questions are almost always better than answers. Questions are almost always better than answers. I like asking questions, and I actually agree to a certain extent that getting people to think through the question more themselves instead of just looking for an answer can actually help people arrive at what is needed to get to an answer, which will inform them better and ultimately provide them a more real and satisfactory answer. Sure, we can get into this all day long if I'm trying to be as generous as possible with Sean, 
But the way that he's utilizing this Socratic method is more about, I'm not going to answer your question, and I'm not going to try to get you to answer your question. I'm going to pose a new statement in the form of a question to subvert the issue that you brought up with a line of argumentation that is supposed to claim some kind of truth value made out of overzealous generalities. And that is not healthy. And that is the game of many apologists. It's a runaround. Again, it is semantics. It is wordplay. It is crowd manipulation. Let's watch his last few statements. I'll give my reply and then we'll wrap up. You don't have to prove the Bible wasn't written by a bunch of random dudes. Nobody believes that. Anybody who knows history and art and literature has at least have to recognize that the Bible's brilliant and influential and the greatest book that's ever been written. And first of all, really quick, we get an additional sentence there that I think proves my point that it's not some earnest quest for truth using the Socratic method, that it's more about controlling the narrative here. Because he straight up says, I don't have to prove the Bible wasn't written by some random dudes. Why not? Isn't your job to give an account for, to provide evidence for what you believe? That's like exactly what you're supposed to do. And if it's so simple because it's so not true, then prove it. But he's taking the responsibility off of himself here and off of Christians in general. You don't have to prove it wasn't written by a bunch of random dudes. Nobody believes that. It kind of sounds like the guy asking the question believed that. I'm sure many people do believe that. I believe it to an extent. I would word it more fairly but it is a collection from many people that did not know each other with completely different philosophies and beliefs about this God, many of which contradict each other. That to me equals a sense of randomness. It's also when you look at the canonization process, the rules laid out for what is collected into the canon may not have been random rules, but they were created by people. And if you had a different group of people creating rules for what would be canon, you would get a different process. So we kind of do have random processes that were eventually bubbled up to the top to make the deciding factors. So in exactly what way is this statement unfair, other than just some of the negative connotation that is smuggled in there. Really, I'm asking for a legitimate answer. Is it because you believe that each one of the men who wrote any part of the Bible was inspired by God completely? Cool. That's your belief. Now we have a new problem. Now we have a level of non-contradiction that should exist. Again, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Either this was a collection written by essentially random men, fallible people, or it's not put together by random men. It's put together by God. So which is it? And then we'll know which way to argue, but don't just avoid the question. And then he ends with this huge statement that anybody who has any idea about art or literature, and he kind of goes through the list again, would have to admit just how influential the Bible is and that it's brilliant and that it is the best book ever written. No, I agree the Bible was influential. I do not think there's any case to be made that it is hands down the world's best book. And I also don't think that influential equals brilliant. Are there brilliant aspects of the Bible? Sure. Man, when I talk about point four in my secular Bible study series, where we go through the literary analysis and we look at for that time and place, some of the literary techniques that were being done and the structure of some of these chapters and why this goes here and how this transitions to that, there are some really brilliant things going on in the Bible. I love some of the poetry. I love some of the metaphors and parables. I love talking in analogies. I think it is such a neat way of communicating ideas, and certain parts of the Bible do this very well. I would even say brilliantly. Do they do it better than any other example we have in literature? No, they don't. Do they do it consistently at the level of brilliance? Absolutely not. Does it also have some really petty, redundant views? Yes. Is it filled with prescribed immorality? You betcha. So no, depending on how you're using the word brilliant, and I could go on all day, I would never put the Bible in the category of brilliant, and I would never make that leap from how influential it has been. This has just been one huge exercise in exaggeration. So. That's it. That's all I have to say. I think it was worthwhile. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your guys' time and attention. It feels good to be back from the work trip. I'm back in the mode. We're making some videos. Thursday, we have Zechariah coming out. And this Sunday, you will get one of two videos, either a part two to what we talked about last week, because I got so many comments that seemed to be from people who just could not understand that even though I was talking about fundamentalism, that was less than half of my life as a Christian. And then a whole nother group of people that said all of those things 
things you said that you experienced at your church or from your parents, etc., they're not biblical. Many aspects of certain parts of how people use the Bible within fundamentalist Christianity are not biblical. Many, many are. It is biblically incorrect to say that these things don't come from the Bible. So I'm thinking about making a response video for that, or we will be doing a video on hijacking the human experience, where we talk about all the things Christianity claims for itself that are just part of being alive. So until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support. My Iconoclist, Anne, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, Sean, my Humanist Heroes, Jared and Christy, my Atheist Advocates, Caleb, Jeffrey, Karen, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my Secular Scholars. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine patrons today.